Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be here and to be invited to participate in these conversations this weekend. So I also want to um, give a special thanks to Professor Andre and the Hankersons for their hospitality and invitation. Um, so I want to begin sort of kind of tracing my own entry into this conversation. So in part, I want to thank Laylee Mapparayan, who I first met in 2001 when I took her feminist methodologies course as a graduate student at Georgia State University in Atlanta. I later uh, had the opportunity to work more closely with her in 2005 as a writing consultant for her Black Feminist Thought course. In the course of that graduate assistantship, I was introduced to scholars such as Joan Morgan, who coined the term hip-hop feminism, Mark Anthony Neal's work, uh, who I'll be talking a little bit about today uh, in his term, Cosmopolitan Masculinity, um, and Gwendolyn Poe, who uh, wrote Check It While I Wreck It, and who I try not to follow around too much at NWSA, where we attend meetings annually. Um, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate that her work reminds me of the importance of intersectional work in hip hop as it marries race, gender, class, and sexuality. I would also go on to later discover the work of Aisha Dunham, uh, Home Girls Make Some Noise, Bettina Love, Little Sisters, uh, Hip Hop's Little Sisters Speak, Trisha Rose's Black Noise, uh, Monty Perry's Prophet of the Hood, Patricia Hill Collins, uh, from, from Black Power to Hip Hop, among others, um, and other scholars. So I mention these scholars as a way of acknowledging uh, just a few of the thinkers shaping what Elaine Richardson calls hip-hop literacies. I also want to highlight those who have centered um, the intersections of gender and sex, sexuality, race, and nationality in their work on hip-hop. Uh, just as hip-hop has been shifting from margin to center, uh, their work is, is sort of supporting that movement as well. So it was in those classes on black feminist thought that I had broadened my understanding of theory and appreciated the everyday forms of knowledge to which we all have access uh, that cultivate in the maneuvering of our everyday lives. In addition to discussing these ideas by Patricia Hill Collins, we also talked about the possibility of quote unquote loving feminism in hip hop too, to borrow loosely from Poe's 1998 article, Love Feminism, But Where's My Hip Hop? Shaping a Black Feminist Identity. It wasn't until later that year and in the decade or so that's followed that the various writings graduate school had introduced me to regarding hip hop feminism started to really synergize. Nationally, it seemed a conversation began to emerge, intensify really, um, as people in the hip hop generation, that group that Bakari Katwana uh, refers to as people uh, being born between 1965 and 1984, who came of age in the 80s and 90s, um, and who, were, um, who share a specific set of values and attitudes, began to really consider the complexities, if not contradictions, of marrying hip hop and feminism. Books like Joan Morgan's When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost and others facilitated my ability to wrestle with some of these contradictions. But perhaps hip hop has always been married to feminism, um, but it was in that historical moment that young people were starting to recognize this relationship and go public with it, so to speak. One of these announcements came in the form of Poe's book, which I mentioned just a second ago, uh, Check It While I Wreck It, uh, which grapples with the tensions that result from considering black womanhood, hip hop culture, and the public sphere. Poe's book uh, shifts the center to recognize the ways that women have always already been present and a part of hip hop history, despite depictions in masculinist accounts that work to marginalize black women. In addition, other books and anthologies, such as Kira Gaunt's uh, book, The Games Black Girls Play, Ruth Nicole Brown's book, Black Girlhood Celebration, and co-authored anthology, Wish to Live, Melissa, and Melissa Harris Perry's book, uh, Sister Citizen, expand our hip hop literacy and love of black women and hip hop feminism. As the conversation expanded, it created the space to not just accommodate, but to actually celebrate black women in particular. This appeared to be a talking back or clap back to earlier examples and evidence of misogyny embedded in and expressed by hip hop culture. Criticisms which have pointed fingers specifically and narrowly at hip hop um, in ways that often obscure the larger patterns of problems in this patriarchy. The notion of hip hop as misogynistic uh, becomes a troublesome trope, not only in its inaccuracy, but it's in, in its inability to see that misogyny is embedded in, a, um, in our patriarchy and expressed in a plethora of ways and genres of music, not just hip hop. <coughs> Excuse me. 
As an example, Trisha Rose comments uh, about the high-pitched, excessively reductive attacks on black popular culture ta that tacitly support and sometimes evade the larger issue of structural patriarchy in the name of protecting black women. She continued to discuss the way this operates to ensure men's authority and deny women much agency, including much sexual agency to, de to determine what they find pleasurable or desirable. Rose acknowledges, quote unquote, society stigmas against female sexual agency and desire, and notes how society attempts to silence women and stifle female-centered and empowered sexual space. Rather than accommodate and affirm this centrality and empowerment, society supports what she calls a silencing of black women's sexual expression. So this was an argument that she made over two decades ago, and it's a conversation that still remains relevant when we consider similar patterns of regulation surrounding black women today. Ruth Nicole Brown's work also speaks to the tensions Patricia Hill Collins describes in From Black Power to Hip Hop between the invisibility and hypervisibility of blackness. Brown notes, after all, it is black girls and women who are sim simultaneously hypervisible in the music videos, continuously invisible as creators and contributors to the culture, and visibly underground organizing as hip hop feminists to challenge hip hop in, as everything masculine, homophobic, heterosexist, sexist, and commercial. Brown and others point to the veritable absence of black women and girls as celebrated subjects in society and an almost ensured erasure, de deliberate disappearing acts and or the muting of our voices as we, according to Brown, quote unquote, remain unknown, unseen and unheard. Against the backdrop of this disappearance and silencing, black girls and women curiously and consistently remain objectified and sexualized, our bodies the target of what Gaunt calls a quote-unquote oft-used mis oft misogynist trope of objectifying black women's backsides. In some combination of fascination, objectification, and or celebration, black women are reduced to their rears or backsides, their ability to be uh, seen as thinking subjects, distorted in what Melissa Harris Perry calls a slanted room. This slanted room throws one's vision or perception off, throwing, making things askew. Just as Harris Perry suggests, multiple perceptions and distortions of black women become possible in this slanted room. The challenge, however, is in the correction, finding the correct perceptions and eliminating the distortions. Melissa Harris Perry's show and the mini conference that she held in 2013 created public spaces for us to challenge these very distortions and engage in the work on personal and professional levels. So I begin with this background and my own entry into the conversation on hip hop feminism, which I will use to frame my talk today. This talk is organized around three themes. The body as a source of embodied resistance uh, and a site of power to be negotiated. Bless you. Um, Minaj, as a, in particular, as a woman of color whose status um, as such frames how we see her in her body. And the music and movement, sorry, the movement and musicality of her body across time and space to perform various identities, including what I describe as, in borrowing from Mark Anthony Neal's work, uh, cosmopolitan hip hop femininity. So when we consider the figure of Nicki Minaj, we can begin to connect the dots between much of this feminist critique and discussion of the attention to women's bodies and our simultaneously disappeared subjectivities. For Minaj, much attention has been paid to her beauty body, and in particular, I will say it in this way, uh, to her super base, but it can be pronounced otherwise. Um, so attention uh, speaks, this attention speaks to the fascination, both generic and specific, um, to the body or to black women's bodies in general and to Nicki Minaj's body in particular. This fascination often toes the line between fetishism and celebration. The former, a historical residue of practices designed to support the surveillance of black bodies and make a spectacle out of them. Consider the work of Dr. Janelle Hobson, who details the pro this process in her dissertation, as well as two of her books, Venus in the Dark and Body as Evidence. Others do this elsewhere, of course, um, including the uh, title Hot and Tot Venus. When taken together, these authors attempt to recuperate the dignity and humanity denied black women in both historical and contemporary moments. Hobson in particular acknowledges how the Hottentot Venus, um, 
whose original name is Sarah Bartman, um, and her body, the body of this South African woman uh, whose par body parts were fetishized and put on display in a French museum in 1810, created an unfortunate pe uh, precedent for the objectification of black women's bodies in contemporary society. Hobson suggests that Bartman haunts us, the spectacle of ostensibly hypersexualized black womanhood, framing the way that we see and or look at black women's bodies. This kind of looking at, though, departs dramatically from the everyday lessons learned by black uh, feminist cultural critic and literary theorist, Bell Hooks, who describes learning uh, an aversion to looking in her own black girlhood. She writes, six brown girls living in a private world no man can enter. We denied the presence of the body. Nakedness was forbidden. In these two rooms that we spent, um, we wanted never to be caught looking. We refused to see our own bodies or one another's bodies. We worked hard to turn our eyes away, to dress in the dark, in half light, to change when no one was there. We lived to forget, to not remember our bodies naked without shame. We dreaded our female flesh. So in this article, Naked Without Shame, a counter-hegemonic body politic, Bell Hooks reminds us of the historical narratives learned both in the home place and in the broader society that preserves the paradox of the hypervisible and invisible black woman. By looking at a black woman and looking away, um, she appears and disappears, in the first case as object and in the second as subject. That Hooks described in 1993, um, her talk as one focusing on representations of the naked black female body, the issue of how we can construct an affirming body politic within white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, a term that she popularized then, um, also reminds us that the work remains to undo much of the dynamic that disparages and denies rather than affirms black bodies. Uh, she writes, although black women have fiercely challenged white supremacy throughout this history, um, we have not focused much attention on the system of domination of the black female body. Rarely does anyone call attention to the complex and diverse ways the body has been foregrounded as a site of conquest in all efforts of colonization. Criticism of white supremacist patriarchal constructions of black female images usually highlights stereotypes. The fact that from slavery to the present day we are likely to be portrayed as mammies, whores, and sluts. Rarely do we articulate a vision of resistance, of decolonization, that provides strategies for the construction of a liberatory black female body politics. Black uh, female bodies are almost always framed within a context of patriarchal, pornographic, racialized sexualization. They are de-aestheticized and de-eroticized. This process began during the colonization of, of this continent by white Europeans. Hooks highlights the contradictory controlling images that construct black women as always already hypersexual and asexual at once. It enables us to consider the differences between being constructed as always already sexy and or hypersexy or not. The difference between hypersexy and hypersexual, however, is one that speaks to the grammar of black womanhood. An idea ushered forth by Krunk feminist collective blogger and Uni uh, Rutgers University professor Dr. Brittany Cooper. Being hypersexy operates as an adjective and a performance, uh, not necessarily a behavior as evidenced through the verb, the implicit behavior being hypersexual. That is, the description of black women as hypersexual pro projects this presumption onto black women with the body as evidence to this point. However, um, what we forget is that people's sexual behavior is their own business, not so much our own. What we can then see as uh, hypersexiness in image is an image, not so much an actual behavior suggested by the image or a sexualized behavior suggestive of sexual behavior. While the two remain related, they are not the same. We see this language and grammar incorrectly yet consistently applied to Nicki Minaj, her body's hypersexualized, her actions presumably to follow suit. The discourse that describes black women in particular as such is flawed for many reasons, but linguistically so for it muddies parts of speech. It conflates adjective to appear sexy with verb to presume sexy links to actual sexual behavior or sex acts with noun to be sexual as in an object. If we take up Hooke's implicit charge to decolonize the body, we must consider the currencies and the penalties attached to our images and offer corrections and interventions wherever possible. One such example of rewriting the script comes from the aforementioned Cooper, uh, who invites us to recognize that black girl is a verb. 
I love this idea. <laughs> so in her grammar of black womanhood, Cooper includes celebrities such as Beyonce, Taraji P. Henson, and Serena Williams. To illustrate with the Serena term, she notes, uh, quote unquote, Serena Williams is another black girl who is a verb, Serena, verb, to slay, to conquer, to body. I would invite us to add Nicki Minaj to this list, where to Nicki would be to both offer up an implicit invitation for viewers to look, to see her as a subject, not only as object uh, in her own life, and to be able to, through her embodied empowerment, challenge these controlling images that circulate about black women's bodies, and also potentially to resuscitate them for purposes of rejecting and or redefining them. In this way, Nicki Minaj remains a curious figure in that she invites the gaze or gazes which attempt to objectify, if not shame her, to speak to Bell Hooks's point. But to Nicki might also mean to appear sexy, but not at the expense of being smart, savvy, or intelligent, and perhaps to make those very qualities sexy. Minaj demonstrates this in an interview with a New York Times uh, reporter uh, when she felt that the reporter was holding her accountable for the actions of men, something that women should never be asked to do. According to Jezebel magazine, Nikki reportedly concluded the interview with these words. Don't, do not speak to me like I am stupid or beneath you in any way. I do not care to speak to you anymore. To Nikki, then, is to remind reporters and others that being sexualized and objectified should not negate one's subjectivity and intelligence. Nikki's talking back clarified that she is not necessarily object alone and that she speaks her mind in ways that allow, us, allow her to recuperate her subjectivity and challenge systems of oppression. Nikki issued another such challenge to systemic oppression, calling out the disparities in recognition in the music industry and getting into a fight with Miley Cyrus at the VMAs. She notes, I'm not always confident, just tired. Black women influence pop culture so much, but are rarely rewarded for it. This echoes much of Brittany Cooper's discussion of the contributions that black women make or have made to society, and in, in a particular example um, that Cooper gives to professional tennis. In response to recent and unsavory comments Raymond Moore made about women on bended knee thanking men, Cooper notes, the Williams sisters playing prime time makes professional tennis associations and network television obscene amounts of money. Just because the Williams sisters' backs ain't bent don't mean they ain't, ain't been carrying the sport. This argument extends beyond the sports arena as evidenced by the abundant contributions Nicki Minaj and others make to the society musically, socially, and otherwise. So as the leading lady in hip hop lately, Nicki Minaj allows us to take up Cooper's charge of quote unquote, actively con uh, constituting and reconstructing a grammar of black girlhood and black womanhood. The active way that girl, black girls do the things we do constitutes new verbiage in its own right. This new verbiage would allow black women far more possibilities for self-authorship around the sexual lives they wanna have, the sexual selves they wanna be, and the sexy things they wanna do. This new grammar would counter the historical con and contemporary regulation of black women's uh, thoughts and ideas, identities, sexualities, bodies, and behaviors. To Nikki would then be to accomplish this, uh, to enjoy what M. Jackie Alexander calls in the pedagogies of crossing erotic autonomy, or that more broadly is called bodily autonomy. It's, let's say, the right to be as sexy as you want to be or not. This sort of autonomy resists the typical objectification of black women as dehumanizing, allowing Minaj to take a page from feminist scholarship by Bell Hooks, Trisha Rose, and others. In refusing to be ashamed of her body as a way of rejecting the plethora of distorted interpretations of her body, she may be taking up Hooks's charge, making a quote unquote, oppositional space where our sexuality can be named and represented, where we are sexual subjects, no longer bound and trapped. Minaj does so while also negotiating the status of what uh, Griselda Pollock calls a to-be-looked-at-ness of women. She invites us to look, right? She, so she's inviting this look in an effort to maximize the extent to which she capitalizes on her degree of to-be-looked-at-ness. For as much as Minaj might invite a variety of gazes that work to objectify, dehumanize, animalize, and hypersexualize her, she is also capitalizing on these controlling images even as she risks reproducing them. This is a point made by Bell Hooks who speaks to the quote unquote totality of our received body image. Our inherited body politics is always that of bondage, uh, the body takeover stripped of its own agency and made to serve the will, desire, and needs of others. 
But rather than remain trapped in troublesome tropes about black women's bodies, perhaps Nicki Minaj is co-opting the controlling image for her own material gain. This ostensibly encourages the commodification and visual consumption of her body, the material consumption of her music, and the ideological consumption of her musical and national culture, uh, both in terms of hip hop and also her, her Afro-Trinidadian heritage. So as she world travels, both transcending and locating herself in various categories, provoking questions and curiosities, she works her body to secure the kind of capital denied black women whose bodies were employed through forced labor or put on display against their will historically. Given her difference, or what Chandra Mohanty might refer to as a construction of the third world woman, Nikki might be purposefully playing on narratives that allow her to auto-eroticize herself and accentuate her various assets, so to speak, as a means of attracting a wide audience conditioned to look at her through a set of lenses and problematic gazes. These gazes include the male gaze, as described by Laura Mulvey in her classic work on visual pleasure, the pornographic gaze as described by Margaret Hunter and Bell Hooks, um, the tourist gaze and the colonial gaze as described by Nicholas Mirzoff in his book, The Right to Look. These gazes are not mutually exclusive, but rather co-creative, converging and at different historical moments, intensifying in its surveillance of bodies, and in particular of black bodies across time and space. This attention to black bodies and its attendant visual pleasure speaks to the spectacle of bodies as they remain sites of power and the negotiation of agency amidst oppression. But what gives us the right to look? The dilemma, as Mirzov puts it, is in not looking, in looking away, or refusing to look. As he argues in the right to look, a refusal to look or a failure to make eye contact or a denial of this direct eye contact, which is normative uh, in Western practice, is a failure to recognize another or an other, as it were. So rather than turning away from the contradictory figure of Nicki Minaj, an application of Mirzov invites us to consider turning towards her, to look not so much at her body, um, but in her eyes, to recognize her so that we may see her in all of her complexity and humanity, and that which is reflected in us in our complexity and humanity. Doing so enables us to recognize her humanity so that this looking at her does not reproduce a problematic gaze or gazes um, and its accompanying resultant objectification. Instead, this looking allows us to see Minaj as someone, as more than a spectacle um, or a singing, dancing, beautiful body, um, but first and foremost as a person who deserves recognition and a freedom to express, um, a freedom of expression that everyone should enjoy. While the bodily and erotic autonomy of black women is so often and easily denied, uh, Minaj deploys uh, her body as biopower. That is, rather than uh, simply feeling fetishized, which she might, um, Minaj act more actively moves to invite the gaze, seemingly borrowing from uh, Nas's made you look, right? Um, and so in seeing that Minaj is participating in what Brown calls a black girlhood celebration or black womanhood celebration, uh, in inviting us to look. Um, she does so potentially risking reifying the many gazes that fall upon bodies in their attempts to colonize, discipline, and penalize. However, we can redefine our ways of looking to align more with an affirmation and a liberation of black bodies, um, a way of looking as recognition, which is more about seeing people than looking at them. This um, looking at uh, reflects what Bell Hooks was describing, the persistent racialized fascination with black women's bodies and a concentration or concentrated attention on the butt. Hooks notes that although contemporary thinking about black women's bodies uh, does not attempt to read the body as a natural uh, racial uh, sign of racial inferiority, the fascination with black butts continues. In the sexual iconography of the traditional black pornographic imagination, the protruding butt is seen as an indication of a heightened sexuality. Contemporary popular music is one of the primary cultural locations for discussions of, of this. So ethnomusicologist Kira Gaunt um, plays on this theme in her book, The Games Black Girls Play. She studies how music and musical play or movement in black girlhood informs so much of hip hop culture, despite little credit given uh, for this influence. She considers how the musical play extends, beyond, extends into black womanhood, expressed in the gestures and movement black women learn um, to make in their musical play and that, that they mature into, into womanhood. 
of the style, uh, Gans writes, because of the accentuated uh, popping action of the booty, females are primarily associated with the dance, uh, although men perform it as well. This association explains uh, the name of the style or genre of this, mu of this music, booty or bass music. In the case, bass doubly signifies. In this case, bass doubly signifies the low end of the body, particularly black women's bodies, and the aesthetic ideals of telling, and emphasizes the low end frequencies of the music. For Minaj and others, this super bass facilitates a double entendre that celebrates, if not recuperates, black women's bodies and the musical style characteristic of hip hop. We can uh, even draw from the cover of the Tribe Called Quest's low end theory as a visual example of this amplification and celebration of the super bass. That Tribe's Fife, who died too soon a few weeks ago, had Trinidadian roots in common with Minaj hints at a point uh, Mark Anthony Neal makes in his discussion of hip hop cosmopolitan a diaspora that you can carry with you. This version of hip hop reflects a global circulation of music as well as the people who are creating and consuming this. This is a point I will return to in a minute. So that Minaj exemplifies this collective fascination uh, with so much attention on her super bass, uh, she cleverly deploys this double entendre in a, in a nod to the low end theory, suggesting that uh, she's strategically deploying uh, these tactics to more fully rather than falsely empower her. This play, with this play on words, super bass, as a way of signifying or conveying the importance of bass in hip hop culture and in music and aesthetic terms, she's also arguably asserting her agency rather than perpetuating internalized oppression that looks like liberation. Her playful depictions of super bass remind us of the multiple meanings of the word and the importance of celebrating black women's bodies, including their body of work. Doing so counters a tendency to ignore and diminish the contributions of women in hip hop, a point Gaunt argues as such. Rarely are women taken seriously as creative and influential artists who contribute to the art form itself. As the number one woman in hip hop, Minaj makes moves to add dimension to this conversation. Her body is literally figuring into the conversation of movement, a theme extending both uh, from or emanating from her body and moving beyond it. Um, through this movement, through acts of migration, dancing, etc., uh, she's building bridges between worlds. This bridging gesture, gestures to feminist and womenist thinkers such as uh, Gloria Anzaldúa, uh, the authors of This Bridge Called My Back, as well as some of the tensions between first and third world feminisms as suggested in the work of Xu Mei Shi in Minor Transnationalisms. This notion of building bridges nods at those who speak um, of the different worlds in which people travel literally and figuratively. Maria Lugones is one such person who talks about world traveling in her work as well as Anzal Dua who writes about it in the, uh, her discussion of the borderlands. Um, author Whitney Peoples picks up the bridge metaphor uh, to discuss the uh, potential disrepair that feminist generations uh, have to engage or the bridge between the second and third waves of feminism. She describes these generational ruptures that have left newer generations of feminists, uh, the third wave, although some believe that the fourth wave has already started to crest, searching for new feminist figures. Um, she writes, young black uh, female writers such as Zooks and Morgan have argued that black women, American women are in dire need of a new feminist movement. She continues, to this extent, uh, Jamila, an author, is arguing, as women of the hip hop generation, we need a feminist consciousness that allows us to examine how representation and images can be simultaneously empowering and problematic. Uh, people's comments beg the question, is Minaj one such feminist figure? With pun acknowledged, I want to turn next to this question uh, to explore how uh, she figures into a conversation on hip-hop feminism so centrally because of her figure. So where th these various um, gazes meet, the colonial, tourist, pornographic, and male gaze, um, where they converge, Nicki Minaj seems to construct a consumable body, visually through her appearance, um, which she subversively describes as Black Barbie, and through the creation of her perfume, Pink Friday, packaged in a bottle of her likeness. In a discussion uh, by feminist uh, theorist Enderpal Gruel, uh, who elaborates in Transnational America, Barbie is the icon of American white heterosexual femininity. That Minaj claims a term for herself speaks to the way black women assert their agency as a means of reminding the public of our humanity as well as our beauty. What then does it mean for Nicki Minaj to appropriate, if not approximate, at least in terms of her body and her super base, uh, this iconic figure? Did she choose this iconic figure from a place of subversion or one of internalized sexism and racism? 
That Minaj refers to herself as Black Barbie turns on its head this practice of making Black people and ideal beauty mutually exclusive. It contests the construction of Black women as always already not just sexual but hypersexual and rejects this idea of a sexually voracious or out of control woman. Black women instead are complex and contradictory figures, um, asserting their agency primarily by resisting hegemonic definitions of them and redefining black womanhood through counter hegemonic body politics as Hooks encourages. By claiming the term and embracing the label black Barbie, uh, Minaj engages in a ver variation of this black girlhood celebration that Ruth Nicole Brown talks about in her work. Uh, this celebration becomes potentially exemplary for black girls um, and, and as we saw evidence on the Ellen show during a performance uh, several years ago, um, little white British girls who want to be just like Nicki Minaj <laughs> when they grow up. Um, so I don't know if any of you know Sophia Grace and Rosie, but they um, squeal in delight about <laughs> their and uh, confess their aspirations to be just like her when they grow up. So, um, and so it, I think, speaks to the um, potential popularity, the actual popularity, but the potential potential um, power of, of influence and the sphere of influence that Nicki Minaj wields in this way. So Nicki Minaj's empowerment of young women also works to counter questionable, questionable notions of darker skinned women as less beautiful than lighter skinned women. However, um, as, even as she's appearing to decolonize her body, she's participating in what Carol Boy Boyce Davies calls blonding. Davies posits, popular representations of the most desirable black women conceptually are analyzable in terms of current practices of blonding. By blonding, I'm referring to the practice and preference of the entire population, I disagree there, uh, for extreme blondness in hair color, texture, and styling, and its related implications given all of the historical meanings of this identity in terms of the deficiency, desirability, and sexuality. The fact that black and Asian women have entered this practice boldly seems to suggest that for women and black women to be seen in a particular way, they have to enter the given mask of an inadequate white fem female representation that has been the historic uh, cultural association of blondness. In other words, white female desirability is identified with golden tresses and all the inscriptions of fun, femininity, and acceptance. So it's not surprising then that every black woman who becomes successful in the media seems to perform this blonding, including uh, Beyonce, Lil' Kim, uh, Mary J. Blige, and Queen Latifah. Uh, Boyce writes that Caribbean subjects who enter these US racialized locations, such as Rihanna and Nicki Minaj, end up being similarly presented as blonde, pink-wigged, or uh, red hair. And I actually just brought the New York Times article, if you can, the cover, you can see an example of this. Um, so while Davy's discussion and critique of blonding is made in reference to this idea of Cheryl Harris's uh, the whiteness as property and uh, a critique of the racial hierarchy that overvalues whiteness, she does leave little space for Minaj and other women to use their hair as a mode of expression. Despite this discussion of, uh, in her book of Caribbean spaces, Davies neglects to draw upon the carnivalesque as one possible source of inspiration for this ex expression. When we frame Nicki Minaj as a Caribbean woman in, the, in a US location, do we develop a different way of seeing her, her body and her cultural and bodily practices? Is a decolonizing of her body doubly possible? If Hook's assertion stands true that contemporary audiences are socialized to believe racist, sexist representations of the black female body um, as authentic and true, then audiences perhaps could appreciate the complexity and nuance to which Minaj appears and attempts to manage much of her appearance in playful and potentially liberating ways. So Minaj's appearance on The Ellen Show and in general signals to broad audiences um, the ways in which black women can and do serve as role models not solely and importantly to um, young black girls, but also to a wide array of audiences whose own heartbeats <laughs> are running away for her. Um, with Minaj's appearance on that show and others, uh, viewers are invited to consider the content of her music um, and any of the contradictions that emerge uh, from how she outfits and herself uh, from her blue hair to a floral bustier that kind of gestures towards Car uh, Carmen Miranda. So in an outfit that um, exposed her body, but not in a salacious or nefarious way, uh, but in a way that signals her enjoyment of fashioning her body and outfits according to her own autonomy, uh, Minaj works to remind us of the very importance of this concept, autonomy. She gestures to Trinidad in ways that remind us of her roots as well as the roots <laughs> in terms of traveling uh, that expand our understandings of identities at the intersections of race, gender, nation, and more. 
While we might want to see her appearance as solely problematic in terms of a perpetuation of a particular kind of body and a body that encourages the affir aforementioned seemingly requisite fascination with particular parts, um, I would suggest a different reading. So certainly what appears to be a celebration of her body runs the risk of advancing racist and sexist stereotypes that the black female body is more sexually free than their white counterparts. Um, there's a way to envision Menage's performative singing and dancing body as one that helps us appreciate Janelle Hobson's point that there's a leisurely youthful game of uh, sashaying and, and sh hip shaking that transforms into sacred space, a fluidity recognized in more African-based cultures. Moreover, this uh, added spiritual component elevates black women's dance to a higher plane of aesthetic appreciation. This appreciation can be amplified when we think about how much Menage operates as a thinking dancing body. So the um, people that support the dichotomy between mind and body or preserve this car <coughs> bless you. <laughs> Uh, preserve this Cartesian split, seeing Minaj as merely a dancing, singing body, um, and often not a simultaneously thinking one. Haunted by the hot and taut Venus, uh, we may see her as simply an unfortunate residue of a racist, sexist past that put black women in our respective parts on display, on auction blocks, in museums, in music videos, etc. Um, however, others may be encouraged to see how Minaj manipulates her body, um, not only to appropriate Barbie, but also Bartman. In an ironic way where these two figures meet, Minaj arguably disappears. In her absence, we see the presence of a Janus figure emerge. On the one side, Barbie, on the other side, Bartman. This marks a curious convergence, no? A coupling of this idealized femin femininity, Barbie, also fetishized but not sexualized or hypersexualized to the extent that motivated the display of Bartman uh, in the museum. So they're operating simultaneously. As Hobson notes, the display of Bartman reflects the racist and sexist notion of an always already black guilt and white innocence. Bell Hooks plays on this theme describing how black women have historically been put on display for whites, reduced to mere spectacle. Little is known of their lives, their motivations. Their body parts were often were offered as evidence to support racist notions that black people were more akin to animals than other humans. Here it would be important to consider the complexity of Minaj's thoughts or her motivations. While uh, some people might want to deny Minaj's intellect and diminish her tactical approach to decolonizing our bodies and our minds, freeing us from what Patricia Hill Collins calls prisons for our minds and closets for our bodies, it might behoove us to consider the strategy she employs at the convergence of Barbie and Bartman's images. That is, while haunted by the legacy of Bartman and um, Minaj as Black Barbie brings her back to life, scripting a new narrative of black womanhood that enables and encourages the very celebration which Ruth Nicole Brown speaks of. This amplifying attention to the very parts of black womanhood, of black women's bodies and lives, um, remind, in doing so, Minaj reminds us that our relationship to our bodies ourselves is the most important one. The proliferation of unsavory and disparaging perceptions of black women's bodies matter, but they matter far less than the ways that we feel about um, not only how our bodies look, but how they feel and how they move across time and space. So I wanna spend the last few minutes um, talking about this movement um, in hip hop culture as framed within the black diaspora. So here I wanna just mention the circuitous routes that transnationals travel, moving between worlds uh, to navigate the geographies of everyday life. This movement has garnered much attention. The movement of black bodies always already on display in public spaces, mobilizing collectively to issue reminders of black humanity and dignity moving to music that becomes the soundtrack of our lives, um, moving communally for peace and social justice, moving across uh, geographies of race, class, gender, sexuality, and nation to, re to configure lives that matter. In this movement, let's consider the work of Duke University professor Mark Anthony Neal, whose work, Looking for Leroy, introduces us to the term cosmopolitan masculinity. I pause here to consider how the term opens up to incorporate and include someone like Nicki Minaj, who, ex whose expressions such as, in this moment I am king, encourage us to consider her performance of masculinity as a black woman. We might also consider a new and in attendant term uh, to the one that Neil introduces in his work. This term would be cosmopol hip hop cosmopolitan femininity. 
This term points to the way that Nicki Minaj, like so many others, moves her body in instrumental and expressive ways, not as a way to capitulate on the controlling images of black femininity, femininity, but to reconfigure and redefine the terms in which representations of blackness get constructed and, represent and interpreted. In introducing and applying the term cosmopolitan femininity to Minaj, we can see some of the routes that she travels, um, in, uh, as well as some of the routes to the Caribbean and beyond. Her successful career may speak to one trope about hard work uh, of foreign-born blacks, um, while al also speaking truth to power. She disrupts this idea of power by deploying and enjoying so much of it, often prompting people to puzzle over her success. This success stands in contrast to the imagined productivity and capability, or lack thereof, of people of the developing world. And her movement between the global north and south maps her own migration, and with it uh, tells an important story of her own power the, um, to maximize opportunities afforded her um, or denied her, as the case may be, um, whether here or abroad. If we see Nicki Minaj through the lens of black womanhood and broaden that to see her as a Caribbean-born woman with a multi-ethnic, multiracial, and transnational identity, we can add nuance to this term of, uh, vexed term of representation, attending not only to how the, her body and beauty are viewed and used or commodified to popularize her music, but also how her national identity gets foregrounded or backgrounded in various representations of her, including her own. So I want to draw just quickly from the um, song Pound the Alarm that uh, provides a taste of this transnational identity and a sense of how Minaj moves to music and between worlds. So sonically characteristic of the Caribbean, um, the sound of the steel pan introduces us to this part of Minaj's identity that sometimes appear to be hiding in plain sight. She amplifies the parts uh, of her that call Trinidad home by dancing in scenes in what look like a local parade or a reiteration of a Caribbean celebration. In addition, in addition to witnessing the revelry of carnival, we observe Minaj comfortably enjoying herself in this celebration. While her body may be seen and judged, scrutinized, and or applauded for her super base, she doesn't carry the residue of shame. Instead, we get the sense that quite the opposite holds true, pure, unabashed shamelessness. Uh, I borrow this term, um, critical shamelessness, um, to suggest that this feminist practice introduces us to an attempt to undo the damage of intergenerational trauma, of the unfair and persistent surveillance, scrutiny, and stigma attached to black women's bodies, and to shift that stigma and shame to intergenerational wisdom and liberation. I conclude by asking, can we take notes from Minaj's performance of critical shamelessness, linking it to Ruth Nicole Brown's Black Girlhood Celebration, to urge us to consider how, um, how to show up as our full selves so that our bodies tell stories that people otherwise cannot hear or might not otherwise listen to. So I would like to um, conclude my presentation by thanking you all for listening and opening up the floor for questions and conversation and uh, feedback. Thank you. Bell Hooks talks about um, womanist over uh, feminist. Do you think that what what the artists are doing is in line with being a womanist, or is it like a show of feminism? Mm -hmm. The Bell Hooks literature that I'm familiar with centers her more in terms of black um, feminist thought. Um, and so I, I mention uh, Lely Maparayan, and I think of her as more of a womanist thinker um, and someone who is um, thinking more in terms of spirituality and that sort of thing. Could you rephrase your question? Let me chew on it a little bit. Um, so from what I understand, and I haven't um, studied bell hooks extensively, but I know that in some of the conferences that I've been to, um, um, women often refer to bell hooks as a womanist and mm -hmm. she i guess states that, that that she's not a feminist at all that she's a womanist and so i was in in terms of the artist um nikki minaj and even beyonce uh, is their display of femininity more of owning their womanist or is it a kind of show in solidarity in terms of feminism. Mm -hmm. I think part of what your question is getting at is um, the way that Bell Hooks critiques white liberal feminism as really exclusionary and the way that um, black women often feel kind of 
less temptation to claim that term for themselves. Um, and so in some ways it helps us recognize that there are a variety of, um, well, you know, as someone mentioned earlier, there's feminism is equal to like, you know, establishing equality. Um, and then there are different ways of practicing or achieving that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, again, I don't, I don't necessarily conceptualize bell hooks as, as a womanist, but um, I so I would want to reflect more on it uh, before providing more of a response. Um, but I think your question sort of gets us to think about the importance of, um, of appreciating all of the kind of nuance in feminist thinking that allows us to see um, you know, Nicki Minaj through a variety of lenses, including the problematic gazes that I mentioned, but also through these various feminist lenses that would ar allow us to arrive at, um, you know, a discussion that allows us to celebrate her body or to suggest that it's, it's problematic and sort of setting us back in terms of feminist movement. So I hope that sort of gets at your question. Yes, Andrea. My question is kind of surrounded around some ideas we've all kind of talked about before, which is like twerking and the history of twerking and how, um, you know, mainstream media really didn't know about it until Miley Cyrus did it. Mm -hmm. But if we are actually looking to twerking, it has West African roots um, where it wasn't sexualized, performed at family gatherings and weddings. And when a black woman's body like Nicki Minaj works, then she's considered, right, uh, a whore, a slut, nasty, a thought, etc. but it's celebrated in a different way with white bodies. My question is, what do you have to say about black respectability politics at play when we start talking about Nicki Minaj, um, in particularly with women in black respectability politics? I think, you know, I would borrow from uh, Trisha Rose's conversation to this, and, and she sort of suggests that one of the things that we do in response to um, countering these unsavory perceptions is that we try to be so like, straight and narrow, pardon the expression, you know, so that nobody can accuse us of anything, <laughs> right? Um, but then what it does is it's a different sort of um, prison, it's a different sort of oppression um, to deny any sort of um, sexual desirability or um, ways of being outside of how other people are looking at you. And I think that that definitely echoes a lot of what's been discussed today, in particular in thinking about how um, the dominant group is able to, um, to suggest how we should see ourselves rather than to, um, to generate that um, much more positively from within, um, and whether that's within individually or collectively com in terms of community. Um, and so that, that it's important to talk back to that, that way of looking. And so that's what I'm attempting to do in this talk is um, to suggest that there's a, a, a longer history that um, is framing the way that bodies show up. So even if, I, you know, I was talking to a couple of students about this, so even if you just show up as a body, right, you're not necessarily twerking or doing anything, um, that, you, that as black women, and you run the risk of being like sexualized or hypersexualized just for breathing. Um, and so I was trying to kind of contextualize that and suggest that Nicki Minaj is troubling that because on the one hand, um, you know, we could ask, does she know this history? And <laughs> does she know she's sort of um, playing off of it? And then the other hand, we can imagine that she does know the history and that she is capitalizing on it very strategically for that reason, so. Hi. Hey. Um, in reference to um, something that you stated about Sarah Bartman and how Nicki Minaj kind of, I guess you can say, um, not an embodiment, but she sort of is representing the black woman and the black body today. How do you feel about the recognition that Minaj has gotten, which um, most cases have been negative from what I've seen um, mm -hmm. concerning her body, but then you have women of other races who are not ethnic who are now altering their bodies to mm -hmm. appear the same way, such as, um, i.e., Kim Kardashian, but she's getting praised for embracing her body on the internet mm -hmm. and you know flashing her assets. So how do you feel about the recognition that Minaj has gotten compared to other women such as Kim K and Amber Rose? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, um, this is a, a conversation that students are having um, on our campus. It's kind of interesting, right? Because 
Kim Kardashian and Amber Rose are can be read as white women, um, but they also sort of fall into that that like liminal space where they're honorary whites, perhaps, um, but not like so not quite black, but not quite white. Um, and I think in that position, then um, it's interesting that there is this double standard that emerges. And I think it's kind of speaking to some of um, what an Andrea is uh, asking about is why does this double standard uh, exist in order to celebrate um, white or white looking women in a way that is often penalizing um, black women for the, the same appearance and, and seeing one as artistic or beautiful and the other um, as, uh, as ugly or um, in less flattering and appreciative terms, right? Um, and so it's, it's kind of asking us to think about how much we're you know, buying into that literally and figuratively, how much we're sort of reinforcing these ideas of what is considered or who, who is considered beautiful um, in our own everyday lives and whether we see ourselves in, in particular ways or not um, because we're internalizing these messages, right? Um, so it gives us the chance to empower ourselves and other people in order, uh, if we're able to kind of push back on, on those double standards and say, um, Nicki Minaj shouldn't be any more or less sexualized than any other women, unless she wants to be, right? Um, but not not as a um, immediate sort of default way of seeing her. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Other questions? Um, I kind of still connected to my previous question. What are, you, what are your thoughts around black women who do um, engage in black respectability politics with other black women, in particular to just like dancing or shaming them for dancing in certain ways, but yet mm -hmm. they're at home dancing the same way behind closed doors. They're right. engaging in these same very behaviors. Mm -hmm. Or privately just sort of like wanting to... To see if they yeah. can make their bodies do the same thing. Yes. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess so to frame it a different way, it's, you know, thinking about... Um, what I was referring to with the bell hooks literature is to be able to um, not refuse to see your body and to not refuse to internalize shame and then to not project that on other people, right? So I think that it's picking up on this um, this discourse about body shaming and specifically slut shaming. Um, and so I think to a different, maybe a different response to the early, first question is um, that some feminists have said, well, the word slut doesn't really have the same resonance, right? So it might be like ho shaming or, um, you know, thought shaming, I don't know. Um, so it's getting at, you know, how do we see that happening? How do we participate in it and, and perpetuate it and maybe not even have the awareness that that's what we're doing? Um, and to see that as a different kind of um, way of, of caging ourselves, right? Of saying, well, this is how you should act or this is how you should behave. Um, and where do we get all of those shoulds and, you know, um, like, uh, rules for how, how we should be um, behaving because it's a different way of regulating and policing our bodies. Um, and, you know, as we know, like that's already happening outside of our community. So if we're internalizing that and perpetuating it on ourselves, um, that first we have to have that awareness that that's what we're doing. And then we have to ask, do, do we want to be doing that, right? And I think that that's, that's important. And that it happens, so I don't want to like fall into the trap that women are more guilty of it than men. Um, so I think it happens in different directions and different ways across different groups. Um, and so so women might shame other women for like, why is she wearing that? Or, you know, why is she dancing like that? Um, and then to just like this, to really get to the affirming, liberating practice is to just say, you know, if that's what she wants to do, that's cool, right? Um, rather than to, to judge it or to scorn it or to say, you know, that's not me. So it's been interesting to see some dialogue on uh, social media with my friends. Um, one who is like, um, like, yeah, I'm okay with uh, the woman who wants to, you know, dance how she wants to dance or dress how she wants to dance or sleep with whoever she wants. And one of her friends was like, really? And she's like, yeah, <laughs> I'm okay with that, you know? And so I think that that's some, like a kind of grassroots example of how we can sort of change the way that we do things so we can say, I'm okay with people living their lives the way that they want, as long as it's not infringing on my freedom, right? And that allows them to be free too then. Thank you. Yeah, sure.